the wood and we're carrying the fire, where's the lamb? Could you just imagine what's going on in his heart? Deep in his soul when his son said that. And yet Abraham demonstrates the faith by saying God will provide himself a lamb. Or in other words, Isaac, God's going to take care of it. He's the one that will provide. It's always easy to see the whole story, right? We have the whole thing. But just for a moment, picture yourself not having the whole thing and seated on Mount Moriah as Abraham binds Isaac up, lays him down. We don't know what Isaac did, but lays him down on the altar. And Abraham, as he pulls out the knife that had slit many a lamb's throat in sacrifice, and as he then looks over and reaches over, lays his hand on his son and is ready to cut his throat. Imagine that. Think of that. How did we get here? What happened? What has brought us to this point? Abraham, at one point, named Abram, a pagan idolater, serving his gods in the land of his fathers, but called out by God, by the one true God, Jehovah Elohim, to a place he would discover later, the land of Canaan, modern-day Israel. God commanding Abraham to go to the place he would reveal to him. Abraham had been chosen by God, but now he must act in faith to realize the blessing and go. And so he does, and God comes to Abraham and tells him he'll make a great nation out of him, and through his descendants will be one who would bless the entire world, the Messiah, come to save his people from their sin through the seed of Abraham. As I said, they stumbled. He stumbled at his faith. He wasn't perfect. He was like me. He was like you. But God several times specifically tells them this, you will have Abraham and Sarah, you will have a child. They stumble, and Sarah convinces Abraham to take his, her servant as his mistress to get a baby and they do and Ishmael comes from that stumbled at faith and now we see Isaac the one who finally came bound and ready to be killed we're back on the mountain he's ready to slit the throat of his son he's passed the test <laughs> I would say he's passed the test. He fears God. He believed God. In other words, Hebrews tells us that, that Abraham believed that God would raise him from the dead. He believed that Isaac was the one that God had promised. God made a promise. Abraham believed it. He didn't understand it. He didn't understand it when he was too old to have children. He didn't understand it when he was told to sacrifice him. But he believed the promise of God. The Bible says it was counted to him for righteousness. He believed. And so suddenly, a loud voice from heaven echoes through the mountain, Abraham, Abraham. Instantly, Abraham, having learned to obey quickly, hollers back, here I am, I'm here. He learned to recognize the voice of God. The messenger of God brings tremendous news. He says, don't hurt the lad. I don't know, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I'll bet you that knife was thrown halfway across the mountain. <laughs> I'm done. Don't hurt the lad. Probably couldn't get those ropes off soon enough off his son and for them to embrace. And God tells him, don't hurt the lad. He'd pass the test. Thou, he, God says, with confidence, thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. He acted in faith to the words and promises of God and obeyed. His action demonstrated his genuine faith. We can learn much from Abraham. We could probably learn something from Isaac. We could probably learn something from the whole scenario. But they are not the most important truths we learn from this account. That's not the most important thing we read and learn here. The story goes on to teach us some very important things. Truths that affect us today. By the way, this was a test, singular test God gave to Abraham. God has never told anyone since to do anything of the like. And he will not. If you hear voices telling you these things, it is not the voice of God. It's a different time frame, different way of doing things. But there are two important truths. And the first one I want to notice is that God required a sacrifice. God required a sacrifice. 
Yes, the sacrifice command was meant to prove Abraham's faith, but Abraham and Isaac did not leave Moriah until a sacrifice was made. They didn't go down without sacrificing something. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, God covered their shameful nakedness with coats of skins, the Bible says. They tried to cover it with coats of plant leaves. But God covered it with coats of skins, a covering made for an, from an animal whose blood was shed, who died in order to appease the holiness and justice of God. Every bloody animal sacrifice given in the Old Testament was a picture of man's requirement, man's sin requirement, needing death as the payment. Thousands upon thousands of innocent animals have been sacrificed in the history of mankind as God's way of pounding into human heads that sin is serious and requires death. In fact, you see that the book of Numbers. Over and over again, there is a phrase that appears. It's kind of a strange book. It's not a whole lot of nuggets of truth for the day, you could say. But over and over again, you see this phrase repeated. So-and-so beget so-and-so, and he died. Death is reality. And death did not happen by accident. Death is a penalty that God imposed on man because man had violated God's holy character. Romans 6.23 clearly tells us the wages of sin is death. There's no way around it. Because we have offended, I have offended God's moral, high and holy character revealed to us in His law, the Ten Commandments and other aspects. I am deserving of death and so are you. God's anger and wrath against sin, His beautiful, holy, righteous anger and wrath against sin, against wickedness, against evil, demands death as a penalty. Why? Because sin is the ultimate crime. It's the ultimate crime because it's committed against the ultimate individual, God. You see, God, as loving creator and ruler, is deeply offended by the ingratitude of people who ignore or rebel against his moral character. Deeply offended. By the way, offended there is not the sense of his feelings are hurt. It is a violation of God. Let me explain it this way. Lying is sin, not because it hurts the one we lie to. Lying is wicked and evil and sin, not because it affects the family. Not because it hurts the good name of the Johnson name. Not because it hurts my spouse when I lie. Lying is wicked and wrong and sin because the Bible says that God is truth. Therefore, lying is opposing truth. It is opposing God. It is saying to God, you are truth. I don't care. That's why lying is sin. Uh, stealing is sin. Not because we hurt those we steal from. We do, and that's wrong. But that's not the ultimate reason it's sin. Stealing is sin because the Bible says that every good gift is from above. God gives us 